Teacher, very shaky golfer this week. Uh, bad round, 112. Oof. Could not hit a drive, and my putting fell apart, which is the one thing I can do on the golf course. So when I'm not putting, I'm in trouble. But I am a storyteller, and uh, that worked out well today. I told some good stories, and uh, I'm a novelist and a writer. I'm actually writing a new book on storytelling right now. It's uh, tentatively called Story Cell with some fantastic subtitle that I actually remember, but it's about uh, storytelling for business and professional reasons. And so uh, that book is due on September 1st. So if you want to occasionally send me an email asking me, hey, Matt, how's that book coming? That'd be great. I got some good news today. It's, uh, by the way, it's uh, two minutes before the hour, top of the hour. So I'm just giving folks a couple minutes to come in because that's when it's supposed to happen. Darn, I did it again. Look at that, Marge. There's people on the stage again. I do not know how this has happened. Well, well people who are uh, on the stage, you're supposed to be somewhere else and you're not. So, oh, well, Matt can't get it right. You'll get to watch me from that spot. There'll be people here anyway, but. I just don't understand what I'm doing wrong. This is really, Matt's good at talking. That's what Matt's good at. He's actually fine with technology most of the time. It makes me look like an idiot, and, and that's okay. I know I'm not an idiot, but when people think I'm an idiot, it's great. It's a vulnerability. I am an idiot in some ways. I'm just generally not an idiot in this way, but apparently I am here. I'll, um, the sad thing is I, I ran a practice one today. And it seemed to go fine. But um, if you don't want to um, be on the stage and you want to watch this and actually be able to comment, all you have to do is go to StoryworthyMD, youtube.com slash at StoryworthyMD. Just land on the YouTube channel and you'll just see me pop up. I'm, I'm already there. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm already there. I can actually go look and see if I'm already there. So if you don't want to have to like be behind the scenes with me, which is weird, but whatever, um, you can just go to my website, go to my YouTube channel, I'm sorry, and find me there. I'm going to go look and see if I'm there. Let's see. Is Matt there live right now? Maybe. I can't actually tell because, again, I'm just not there. I don't know. I swear I'm not as dumb as I look. I swear I'm not as dumb as I look. I swear I'm – oh, hold on. I swear I'm not as dumb as I look, but it is questionable at times. Again, it's nothing wrong with being dumb or expressing stupidity. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I'm on. I'm live. So if you don't want to stare at this, it's nothing wrong with being dumb. Yeah, I'm. The, I'm. I'm. I'm live. So you can just go to my YouTube channel, YouTube dot com slash at Storyworthy MD, and then you can actually leave chat messages and things so you can just stay behind the scenes with me in some weird way because i've given the wrong link out again and i have to learn things it's okay to be dumb uh today i was waiting for my son i was picking him up from camp and uh most of the people drive through and pick up their kids i park my car and walk up a path because it's just a lot easier for me and uh while i was waiting i was with a younger person than me let's say he was 24 and he had to call for charlie and he had a walkie-talkie and he called for Charlie on the walkie-talkie, but he did not use the walkie-talkie properly. I know. I use walkie-talkies as a teacher. I knew the call didn't go through because when you talk on a walkie-talkie, you can hear yourself on the walkie-talkie, and he couldn't hear himself. So I was like, well, Charlie's never going to come because this guy won't use this walkie-talkie, right? And I said, hey, I'm not sure if that walkie-talkie is working for you. And he said, no, no, I'm sure it is. But I could see in his eyes that, like, fear that, oh, no, this guy's possibly right and all these like camp counselors are walking by and all this person has to do is say hey can you come and help me but he couldn't do it for 15 minutes 15 minutes i stood there and let him flounder because he didn't want to look foolish when looking foolish is one of the best ways you can ever look in this world because it makes everyone feel better about their foolishness and allows you to express vulnerability which most people are unwilling to do so um when you're willing to tell people that you're an idiot in a certain regard uh, it, uh, it's a courageous thing to do. Not I'm courageous. I'm not courageous. Actually. I had a, co I had a conversation with a person in a workshop once someone who's attended many workshops with me. And during one of the workshops, she said to me, you're the bravest person I've ever met because you tell stories about everything about yourself. And I said, it requires great courage to do the kind of thing that I'm doing, except not for me. 
because for some reason I was born just willing to say every single thing. I was born this way. It doesn't take any courage. It's not hard for me at all. I love doing something foolish, shameful, embarrassing, terrible, and then immediately telling people about it. So for me, it's not hard, but for most people it is. It's probably also more difficult if you're not me, meaning if you are not a white, straight American man with no physical and mental disabilities, if you are younger or older, these are all create problems in terms of um, sharing because not everyone is willing to listen to you like they're willing to listen to me. So I acknowledge that too. I always like to, to mention that. Well, thank you for joining me. I see that there are some people actually on YouTube, which is great. I am here. Uh, I am here on Monday, June 26th. Today, I'm going to be showing you how I create stories, how I find stories, how I craft them, and how I convert them into professional and business purposes, maybe even some other purposes if those reasons come up. I'm going to play a game with myself called 321, which if you're familiar with it, you get to watch me play it. And if you're not familiar, you get to learn a new storytelling game. I'm going to play 321. And from 321, which is sort of a storytelling improvisational game that I invented years ago to help people find and tell stories. From this improvisational game, I'm going to come up with a brand new story based upon a prompt that I'm going to receive in a moment. And then I'm going to craft that story in a very imperfect way. I'm not going to sort of spend a lot of time putting it together. I'm going to give myself about a minute to formulate something in my head and then tell you the the imperfect or the the first draft, we'll say, version of that story. But then more importantly, once I'm done the first draft of the story, I'm going to talk to you about how I can use that story in a professional or a business or a maybe even an academic purpose for teachers and people like that. Uh, the goal here is to help you understand that the content that you have, which is to say the life you are living and the stories that you're accumulating over time, the moments of meaning that you have are so important and useful. If you are a business person, a professional person, a teacher, a psychiatrist, a therapist, a parent, anyone who sort of needs to communicate information of meaning to someone else, the content that you generate is enormously valuable. I work with people in business all the time, and I always say that there's two kinds of people in business. There are Band-Aid people and brick people. I like brick people better than Band-Aid people, but I'm happy to help either. A Band-Aid person is a business person or a professional person or anyone who comes to me and says, Matt, our company needs a new marketing campaign. Matt, we're producing a new commercial. Matt, our sales team needs some training. Could you please help us? That's a Band-Aid person, which is to say, we have a problem and we would like you to come in and put a Band-Aid over it, fix it for us. And I do that all the time. That is the bulk of the work that I do. But I have brick people too, clients who understand I have a company, it has some problems, but what I'm trying to do is become a better storyteller. Brick people start with stories. They come to me and they say, Matt, something happened between me and my son the other day. Let's craft that into a story, the same kind of story that I would tell on a stage for The Moth or my, our show Speak Up, any of these. And once that story is all crafted, only then do we begin speaking about what the business purpose for that story might be. Those are brick people. Those are people who understand we're building content. We're layering that content. We're finding reasons for that content. Those are the best clients I have. Those are the ones who become great storytellers. The others are people who have problems and use me to solve those problems. Perfectly fine, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're becoming better storytellers. Almost always they're not. Almost always they just have me coming in to solve their problem. And then oftentimes I go away until they have another problem. I do have clients who are both brick and bandied people, which is to say they start as a brick person, but then they might, you know, knock on my door someday and say, hey, Matt, I know I'm building a foundation and I'm building this wonderful wall of storytelling, but I happen to have a problem in sales right now. Can you just jump in there and solve that problem too? I'm more than willing to do that. But if you're a brick person, you understand that it starts with the story. It doesn't start with the problem or the purpose. It starts with the story. And once you have the story, once you find it and craft it, then we find purpose and meaning for that story. What value can it have in the work that you do? Hopefully that all makes sense. Uh, I have a wonderful course actually called Finding Stories. You can get to it at storyworthymd.com. It is exactly the course that you can use to begin finding these bricks, these, this content that you already possess. You have a vast storehouse of stories, moments of meaning, that you can deploy in strategic ways throughout your life to connect to people, to do better business, to be a better professional, to make more friends, to deliver better sermons, to 
to, to be better at your keynotes and your all hands, all of these things. The first step is finding stories. I often, almost always, frankly, run into people who want to tell better stories. It makes total sense to me. I actually think the more important work, the more valuable work, the essential work is finding the stories to tell. If you don't have a multitude of stories, if you're not capturing the content that you're already in the process of creating merely by breathing, then you're wasting your time. So my course, Finding Stories, gives you a whole bunch of strategies, including the one I'm about to teach you, so that you can begin finding stories in your everyday life, which will change your life in so many ways. It will make you a happier person. It will allow you to see your life through a, through a better, more accurate, uh, more blessed lens, frankly. It's going to do a lot for you. So uh, this is one way that you can learn how to find stories. If you're interested in finding more, my course, Finding Stories at StoryWorthyMD.com. All right, let's get started. I have my phone because I'm going to use a website to randomly generate three words for me. We call it 321. The three comes from the three words that I am going to get with this random object generator. In a minute, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click unique too. I'm using the, the random object generator perchance.org slash object. There's a million of them on the internet. This is the one I like the best. Perchance.org slash object. It's a random object generator. I'm going to click the button. It's going to give me three objects. That's the three. I have to come up with a story from my life pertaining to one of those objects. I have to choose one of them and find a true story that includes one of those objects in my life, which sounds ridiculous, but everyone can do it. Everyone from seven to 97. I've worked with everybody. They always find a story. It doesn't have to be much. We're lowering the bar on storytelling in this game. A story might be a 20 second moment in your life somehow involving that object all the way up to you could speak for 20 minutes about that object. I'm not going to speak for 20 minutes about it because that's not going to be great. The two comes to you get about two minutes to tell your story. Most stories take more than two minutes, but we tend to give people about two minutes because they're sort of crafting it very quickly off a random object. So no pressure. Speak for anywhere from 20 seconds up to two minutes. That's the two and three, two, one. And the one is you only have one minute to craft it. Only one minute to think about what you're going to say. This lowers the bar in storytelling. No one expects excellence when playing three, two, one. The goal is not excellence. The goal is let's find some new stories. Let's use a few of the strategies that I teach uh, I'll give you a strategy today that I'll use that you can begin using and then uh, tell that story and then we'll figure out what to do with it. The strategy I'll give you today is a simple one I repeat all the time. It's location and action. Every story should start with location and action. Every story that I tell tonight, maybe I'll play two of these games for you. We'll start with location and action. Location to activate imagination, to get the movie playing in your mind's eye and action because people like stories to begin. They do not want prelude. They do not want exposition. They don't want to learn something before you begin telling the story. Start the story. And if you need to teach us something or instruct us in some way, do it over the course of the story and not at the front of the story. So location and action, that's the strategy I'll practice while using perchance.org slash object to come up with three objects. Are you ready? I'm ready. Here we go. I'll show you the, um, I'll show you what I got. Okay. So I've got, what is it, needle, light bulb, and a pair of safety goggles. So I've got three objects. I need to come up with a true story from my life using a needle, a light bulb, or a pair of safety goggles. And I have a minute to come up with it. Now, if I'm playing the game in person or you're playing in the game in person, what normally happens is I run to a corner and quietly think to myself. Because I'm a teacher, I'm going to do a little think aloud for you. I'm going to show you how I sort of process this information. I'm going to speak it out loud. So maybe you can learn something from that too. So needle. Essentially, the purpose of this game is if you had asked me to find a story about love, that would actually be hard for me to find a new story because I would just immediately gravitate to one of the many love stories I've told in my life. But needle is interesting, right? So now instead of love, which is sort of like casting a wide net, Needle is like a laser pointer through my life. Now, needle's interesting because it could mean multiple things. It could be a sewing needle. It could be a hypodermic needle. It could be the needle on a record player. It's actually a great word. I don't love it because I already have a good needle story, and I'm not going to repeat a story for you. I'm not going to try to sound great by telling you a story I already know. So immediately I thought, do I have a record story, a record needle story? I kind of do, actually, but it wouldn't be very long, and it doesn't have a lot of meaning to it, so I'm going to skip by that. Do I have a sewing needle story? Nothing comes to mind. Actually, something does come to mind. I could tell a sewing needle story too. Maybe I'll go over these later with you so you can see sort of what I'm talking about. But I'm going to skip that for now. Light bulb is the next one. I have a light bulb story. 
Uh, I have two light bulb stories. Oh, I have two light bulb stories. They're both very good. I'm so depressed that I'm only going to tell you one of them. And then I also have a pair of safety goggles story. I have all of them. I bet you do too. I bet you have at least one. Uh, if you don't, trust me, you do. Uh, Seven-year-olds have never have, have never failed to play this game. You could too. I'll go through all of them and just summarize them very quickly when I'm done. But I think I'm going to go with the light bulb story. In the theme of when you're an idiot, admit that you're an idiot. I'm going to tell the light bulb story, which I've never told before. All right. But my friend tells it a lot. So you can tell what an idiot I am when my friend tells a story quite often. All right. So the story is going to go something like this. I'm standing in my daughter's bedroom as she hands me the lamp that sits behind beside her bed. She tells me that it's broken and I flip the switch off and on and it doesn't work. So I change the light bulb. And when I change the light bulb and I plug it back in and I flip it back off and on, it still doesn't work. And I can't fix electrical things. It's not safe. And these hands do not repair. They only purchase and replace. But I have a friend named Jeff and Jeff can fix everything. So the next day I go to school, he's a kindergarten teacher and I bring it down the hall and I say, this is Clara's favorite lamp that was given to her when she was born. Can you see if you can fix it? And he says, sure. He's actually Clara's godfather. So it's a reasonable request. Jeff appears in my classroom the next day and he says, I changed the light bulb in the lamp and now it works. What you have to do when the light bulb burns out is you have to change the light bulb and that makes the lamp work. And I say, I swear I changed the light bulb. And he said, uh-huh. And he gives it back to me. I'm really upset. I plug it into the wall. I flip it on and it works. I am an idiot beyond compare. Three years later, Clara comes to me and says, dad, the lamp is broken again. And I say, listen, we're not going to go through this again. We're changing the light bulb. We're going to make sure that it is actually broken. And so I remove the light bulb. I replace it with a new light bulb. I plug it in. I flip it off. I flip it on. I flip it off. I flip it on. It's not working. I have Clara do the same thing to verify. Everything is clearly correct, but still broken. I have replaced the light bulb. It is not working. I go back to school, back down the hallway, back into the kindergarten classroom, back to Jeff. I have the lamp again. It's not the bulb this time. I promise we have tested it. Could you please see if you could fix it for Clara? And he says, sure. He comes into my classroom the next day. I change the light bulb in the lamp and now the lamp is working. If you want to fix a lamp, the first thing you should do is change the light bulb. And I can't believe it. I think he's messing with me. But his wife, who would not mess with me, confirms that Jeff brought it home, changed the light bulb, and then the lamp worked. I can't explain it except to say, I can't fix anything. I've never in my life been able to fix anything. And even the act of changing a light bulb twice was something I was incapable of doing. Thank you. All right, so that is my light bulb story. It's not bad. I don't know if it's like the kind of story I'm going to go to the moth and tell on a moth stage. I don't know if it has enough meat on the bones yet. But what it is, at this moment at least, is a great anecdote. If I want to tell a story about my inability to fix things, my, my desire to purchase and replace rather than repair, it's a great anecdote. And stories are often built on anecdotes. And so this could be a building block of a story about my... <laughs> my occasional feelings of being less than a man, right? I'm already, I'm already thinking about the time when I listened to Jeff and Tom talking about how Jeff planted trees too close to the home, his home, and the radiant heat was affecting the growth of the trees. And I thought to myself, I don't know how to plant a tree. And, and a house, the location of the house can impact the growth of a tree. Like there's just things that I don't even know that I don't know in the world when it comes to these things. So it's a building block. So that's my story. Uh, before we go over sort of what I could use it in business for, and I can already think of a, a million ways to use this in business. Uh, let me tell you some of the examples of stories that I could have told so that you can get a sense of how small these stories don't can be. They don't have to be huge in order to be successful. Uh, so the needle story, I have a hypodermic needle story that's really uh, a big story I've told. It's one a moth slam. It's a very popular story that I tell quite a bit. But record needle story, I have a record needle story, oddly. Uh, I had a record player when I was a kid, 
It lasted for about um, 14 hours. I bought uh, Springsteen's Welcome to Asbury Park, which is the record I bought, the one record I ever bought. I put it on the record player. I played it for about 14 hours straight, and then the record player died. Uh, the needle broke, and the thing failed, and I went upstairs and told my parents that the record player broke, and they said, why are you using a record player? Uh, there's things called cassettes, and we use cassettes these days. We're not fixing your stupid record player. And so I bought Welcome to Asbury Park, the only record I've ever purchased in my life. I played it for 14 hours. It broke the record player. And that was it. From then on, I uh, bought cassettes and then CDs, and now music does not come in a physical form anymore. See, not much of a story, right? But I had forgotten all about that until I just remembered Welcome to Asbury Park as being the one album I have. I still have it, too. It's in a, it's in a bin just in the other room. So that's a needle story. Uh, the sewing needle story is a simple story about how when I met my wife, she is a knitter and a sewer, and I did not understand the difference. I didn't know there was a difference. I thought those two words were synonymous. I thought if you knit, if you were knitting and sewing, that was the same thing. And it took me like three years. And honestly, it didn't take me three years to figure out the difference. What it took was one moment when my wife was not going to put up with it anymore. For, for three years, I would say, oh, Alicia is knitting. And she would say, I'm sewing. I'm using a sewing machine and I'm sewing. Or sometimes I would say she's sewing and she'd say, I'm knitting. These are booties for our baby and I'm knitting with needles and I could never keep it straight. And honestly, I probably never tried to keep it straight. And then one day I said that Alicia was sewing. I remember I was on the phone telling someone, oh, Alicia's sewing right now. And she was knitting a scarf. And that was it. It was like, it was the, the needle that broke the camel's back. And she just hammered me. She was like, you can do so many things and you can remember like so many things and you can, you can tell a story that goes 17 minutes and remember the whole thing, but you can't remember the difference between sewing and knitting. Can you get it right? And that was the moment I learned. Because it turns out that sometimes the only reason we learn something is to avoid the ire of the person we love. See, that's a little story. Now, is that going to be something, again, I tell on the stage? Maybe not, but that is the needle story that I came up with. I have two light bulb stories. Well, that one. And then I have the light bulb story where when I got married, Alicia is Jewish and I am not. And so we incorporated a few of the Jewish traditions in our ceremony. We had a chuppah. And um, I had to stomp on a glass, except that you don't stomp on a glass. I learned that day you stomp on a light bulb because it pumps and it's also made of glass. And uh, none of my friends understood it because none of my friends are Jewish. And when I stomped, it made this loud pop. And it scared one of the guys in the bridal party, actually. It really scared him. He, he didn't expect it because he's not Jewish. He didn't know what was going on. And I remember in the middle of the ceremony, I stomped and it, it popped. And he, he did like a, whoo, like a, like a little, like, he sounded like a little girl. Uh, his name is Gary. He sounded like a little girl at my wedding because I popped a light bulb at my wedding. Again, not a huge story, but again, I had forgotten that for like the last 15 years. But later on, I'm going to call Gary and say, hey, remember when you screamed like a little girl at my wedding ceremony because I stomped on a light bulb? And again, came back to me because I saw that. And then the pair of safety goggles is great. Uh, sometimes with, one, with my students, if they're doing a really great job on an assignment and they've been practicing and doing a you know, good job, you practice that math, I don't need to collect it because it's just practice. What I sometimes do is I allow all the children to crinkle up the work into a ball and then I pull a number from my bucket. Every kid has a number and the kid whose number is pulled has to stand in front of the class. I put on a pair of safety goggles and all the kids get to throw the paper at the kid who's wearing the safety goggles. And oddly, everyone wants the paper thrown at them. They're all hoping to be the kid wearing the safety goggles, have the paper thrown at them. And then they have to pick up the paper in one minute or we never do it again, which is always exciting because now we have to watch a kid collect 20 pieces of paper in one minute or risk uh, never having this happen again. It's so joyous. It is my attempt as a teacher to constantly make school fun for my kids. And that is one of the ways I do it. I'm sure if administrators knew about this, I'd be yelled at for nonsense because they have decided to climb some miserable ladder and the further they get away from children they forget what it is like to be a child or a teacher who wants kids to have fun they think about things like lawsuits and unhappy parents i don't have any of those problems anyway those are all the stories that i came up with hopefully you came up with some too using needles light bulb and a pair of safety goggles but i told the what story did i end up really telling what was the one I really told? Oh, the light bulb with Jeff story because I wanted to show how he's an idiot. So let's think about what I could do in business with that story. The problem people have is they often think content to content, meaning 
Well, you can only really tell that story, Matt, if you're dealing with light bulbs or lamps or godfathers, things like that. And that's sort of like the idea that you're trying to match content to content. I need to find a way to incorporate lamps and light bulbs into my business or professional purposes. But that's not how we do it. We do it instead through theme, message, and meaning. We think about the story I told, which is not really a story, but it's decent, the one about Jeff. And when we're thinking about theme, message, and meaning, I ask myself, what is this a story about? Well, it's a story about understanding that in some things, we're just never going to be very competent. I have to acknowledge the fact that even when it comes to changing a light bulb, there's jokes about how many people does it take to change a light bulb, right? I am like the joke. I am the worst of the joke because I change a light bulb and it still doesn't get fixed, right? So it's a story. The theme is we need to recognize that there are times when we're just incompetent and we're going to look foolish and that's okay. Like it's fine that it's, it's okay to not be an expert at everything. So can you already begin to think about ways that this might be useful in business, right? You might run into someone in business. Let's say you own a company and let's say your personal assistant is just like sort of incapable of, uh, incapable of um, purchasing excellent gifts for your clients, right? The holidays come around and you want your personal assistant to purchase gifts for your clients. And every year they purchase terrible gifts. They just don't have a sense for it, right? It's a story that works both ways in a situation like that. One is as the boss, you have to understand, you know what? Some people are just not going to be competent about some things and you're gonna have to let that go. And that's a true thing. Like there's just sometimes in business, you're like, you know what? Joe can't do that. So don't ask Joe to do it. He does a lot of good things, but let's find the things we can't do. And if we can't train them up, I cannot be trained up when it comes to fixing things. We just find someone else to take care of that. We delegate that responsibility away from Matt because he can't do it, right? Or... So that is the boss looking at the employee. As the employee, there's nothing wrong with saying, listen, you've given me this job to do. There is a part of this job I can't do. There's just a part I can't. Clearly, when it comes to using Restream, the platform that we're on right now, I am incapable, apparently, of creating a, the proper link because people keep ending up in my studio instead of outside my studio on YouTube. I still have random people in my studio right now. Right Now, Matt can probably get trained up on this one. But there are times in business when you just, you can't do it. There's just, that person can't do that job and it's okay. It's acceptable to not be competent in all things. It's also a great personal sort of growth story. The idea that we can try like hell to be good at something. We can really, really work hard at getting excellent at something, but there are sometimes just barriers. We just can't do things sometimes. I had a girlfriend who was a school psychologist and she was doing a new, uh, she had, got, she was, sorry, I had a girlfriend who was a school psychologist and she had a new test that she had to administer and she was administering it on me to practice before she administered it on kids. And she got mad at me in the middle of the test. She said, I need you to really try. And I said, I'm really trying. And it turns out when the test was done, when it comes to visual spatial understanding, I am around a nine-year-old in visual spatial understanding, which is to say, if you show me a shape and you say, which way do you have to rotate it to fit it into, the, into this peg? I can't see it. I can't see rotations or flips. I can't do any of those things. When we get Ikea products in our home, my wife builds them. I cannot follow directions to build things. Right now for my upcoming solo show, I have a whiteboard that I'm going to drag out onto the stage and do some drawing. The whiteboard is in my living room in pieces. I took it out of the box and that is the extent of my involvement in the assembly of the whiteboard. I asked my wife, can you assemble this for me? And my son, Charlie said, I can do it for you, dad. He's 11 and he can, I can't, I cannot look at directions and figure out how to put things together. And that's okay. The story can be really useful. And the idea that, we don't always have to be excellent at everything and acknowledging our limitations and allowing other people to fill the gaps and step up and help us and, and take care of business that we can't take care of. All of those things are really helpful too. So for all of those business purposes, I could easily use that story. And there's a multitude of others I could think of. Uh, it's a great story about vulnerability. Just the idea of like when the boss gets up and says, Hey, let me tell you the thing that I can't do. Right. Let me tell you about the thing that no matter how hard I try, I can't get this done. 
I bet you have some of those problems too. Let's talk about how we can get those things solved, either through retraining or if you're like me and you're just never going to learn it. Let's delegate those responsibilities away from you. Maybe you take someone else's responsibilities instead. It's good leadership. It's a good leadership uh, skill that you can use. All right. So that is how I would use that story in business. And you give me half an hour, I can come up with 15 other things that we could do with it. But I can easily see it in all of those contexts. All right. I'll do it one more time. And then if you have any questions, you can drop them in the stream. Oh, I see. Uh, I see everything's working great, says Joey. Thank you, Joey. If you are um, if you're in uh, YouTube and you want to leave a comment, uh, I can actually see your comments. I have that working out great. Um, if you're in the studio, I have no idea what you're doing. So figure that out on your own. I'm going to play the game one more time. And then once again, I'm going to show you how we can use these stories in a business and professional um, example. This time, I won't go through all of them. Um, I'll just go through. I'll, I'll just tell one story and then we'll figure it out. I just clicked, but I got a pair of safety goggles again, weirdly. It gave it to me twice. So I'm not going to use that set. Oh boy, this is an interesting um, one, but I'm going to use it because why not? Um, I have candle, tomato, and rope. <laughs> Those are, feels like um, I'm playing Clue. Candle, yeah, candlestick, rope, and then there's a tomato. All right, so I'm going to, again, rather than looking at for a wide net with some big topic in my life, I am going to take a laser pointer into my life. You do the same thing right now. Let's do it together, right? Candle. Let's think about all the candles in our lives and be expansive in your thought of candles. So we're thinking about birthday candles. Did you have a significant birthday candle moment in your life? If you're 80, you already had one. If they stuck 80 candles on that cake, congratulations, you have a story to tell. But think of other candles too. Did you have a candlelight dinner? Did you have a blackout once where you required candles in order to sort of find your way around the house? Did a candle ever create a fire for you? Did a candle ever create a problem for you? Did the hot wax of a candle ever create some issue for you? I'm laser pointering my way through my life thinking of all the candles I can remember. God, I just found some candles in my past. We had these sconces hanging on my dining room wall and now I can see my dining room wall which was wallpaper with horses and cowboys. And on that wall, there were wooden sconces. And in those sconces were red candles that were never lit for all of my childhood, which is already a story. There, I just told you a story. Nothing happened, but for me, oof, I'm standing in my childhood dining room now and I can see it more clearly than I've seen it in a long time because candle got me there. I don't really have a story though for candle, to be honest with you. I can't think of anything right now related to candles. I'm gonna skip it for now and go to tomato. Do I have a tomato story? So again, I'm thinking about tomatoes all the way through my life. I do have a tomato story. Uh, it's not good, but and it happened just a few years ago, but it is a tomato story that I've never told before. So I could use that, but I'm not settling on that. The first choice is oftentimes not the best choice. So let's keep going. Think about tomatoes in your life. Did you ever plant them? Pick them, eat them. Do you hate them? Do you love them? Did your parents make you eat them? Did you have a moment with a salad? Did you ever have rotten tomatoes thrown at you? I have not. It'd be amazing though, wouldn't it? Like some bad things that happen to you, you kind of wish they would happen once. I'm not asking for that in my solo show. Please don't do that. Okay, so I have a story about tomatoes if I have to use it. And then I have rope. Rope's a tricky one for me. Uh, as a storyteller, or at least as a storyteller the way I am, I like words that are hard. A group once gave me potpourri, fondue pot, and chandelier. It was clearly a group that didn't like me. But I had a chandelier and a potpourri story, and I won a moth story slam with the chandelier story. So, haha, -ha, I, I crushed them. Rope is my, the problem with rope is that I have so much rope in my life, it's almost too much. It's almost too easy for me to find a rope story. I was a Boy Scout, so I spent my whole life learning to tie knots and lashing shelters together. I, I just found a good rope story involving a shelter. I found another good rope story involving building a latrine in the woods. They're both fine. I think I'll probably tell the tomato story because it's nice and easy, but is there anything else about rope? There's just so much rope in my life. It's a harder thing to use. So I guess I'm going to have to, oh, I got a rope story involving a snapping turtle, but I've already told that story, so I'm not going to do it now. But that would be my best rope story, which would make you all cry, including me. So we won't do that. I'm taking one more second to sort of laser pointer my life 
looking for ropes and not really finding any other than latrine and the shelter tying ropes. I could tell you, I could never tie a sheep bend. Even to this day, Charlie's learning how to tie knots. Now Clara is too, actually she's in scouts and I can, I can help them with all the knots, but I can't tie a sheep bend. It makes me crazy. A sheep bend is a knot that is used to connect two pieces of rope together in a sturdy way. And even today I can't tie that stupid knot. It makes me crazy. All right, I guess I'm going to tell my tomato story. All right, we'll tell a tomato story and then see if we can find a professional or purposeful or business-oriented use for it. It's a, it's a short and simple story. And it goes something like this. I'm sitting at the dining room table with my family. Uh, my family amounts to a wife who eats everything except cilantro and judges you for the things you don't eat. She would deny this and uh, she would be lying. When you don't eat a food that she eats, she thinks that it's your fault. She thinks that somehow you have control over your taste buds. She thinks that, like, I don't want to eat everything, which I would. I would love to like all foods, but I cannot. We don't have control over what we like. And so I try things all the time, and I don't. I have that wife. She's sitting there. Me, on the other side of the table, someone whose palate is admittedly limited, uh, but I try everything. And I try it more than once and I want to like everything and I simply can't. We could get into the science behind this, by the way, because there's a lot of science behind taste and how people genu genu genuinely don't have taste. And if you like more foods today than you did when you were a kid, it's because you have about half the number of taste buds that you had when you were a child, which is why kids don't like a lot of foods because they actually taste the foods. And as adults, we don't taste it as much. And I happen to be, we're going to go off the rails here. I'm a super taster. Um, I am a super taster, meaning that you can order this kit from Amazon and other places. Some people taste things in extraordinary ways that others don't. So I claim for years that I'm a better taster than, than most people. And my friend Kim went and bought the super taster kit one time for our book club. And she passed these little paper strips around and everyone put the paper strip on their tongue. And she said, does anyone taste anything? And I would say, yes, licorice. No one else tasted anything. She looked at the card and she went, oh my God, it's licorice. How can you taste licorice? No one can taste anything on the little piece of paper except for me. I'm a super taster. So I don't like foods and it's not my fault. I went off the rails there. I apologize. So there's me and Alicia. Then we have these two other children. I have Clara who has autism and that creates some food issues for her already. And she has a peanut allergy, which creates even more food issues for her. So she doesn't eat anything. She eats like nine foods and it makes Alicia crazy. And it would make me crazy, except I know that both parents can't be crazy. So even though I want to be crazy about it, I choose to not be the crazy parent because there's already a crazy parent. So I pretend to be rational parent. That is my role in this situation. And then there's Charlie, who has no reason not to try foods. He doesn't have autism. He's not allergic to anything. He's just a jerk. So he's the jerk at the table who refuses to try things because he's a jerk. And so we're sitting at the table one night and Alicia has been growing food in the garden, which amps up everything. Because when you grow food that people don't like, you're even more angry than ever before. It's not that you went to the store to buy it. Now, like you have grown it with your hands and the sun and the water and the effort. And then people say we don't like it and it just makes her crazy. And uh, she has tomatoes, which I don't like. I like ketchup and I like spaghetti sauce, but I don't like tomatoes. I don't like actual tomatoes. And she's got a little bowl of cherry tomatoes on the table. And Clara's never going to eat them. And we know that because she only eats like six things and that's her and we can't do anything about that. And Alicia's going to eat them because she eats everything but cilantro. By the way, I eat cilantro. And, uh, and I am not going to eat the cherry tomatoes because I don't like cherry tomatoes, except I have a little jerk here who's refusing to eat the cherry tomatoes because he's a jerk. And so even though I know I don't like cherry tomatoes, I say to Charlie, you know what, Charlie? I'm going to try a cherry tomato. I know I don't like them, but we should try things more than once. And I've tried it many times, but I'm still going to try a cherry tomato tonight just to see if I like it. And so I eat a whole cherry tomato, which is pretty extraordinary because I hate them. And so I eat the cherry tomato and I, say, I swallow it and I say, you know what? I didn't really like it, but I tried it, Charlie. I think Alicia's going to think I'm a blessed hero for doing this. She doesn't care at all. Like, she's like, whatever, you're all terrible human beings. I don't like any of you. And then this rotten thing happens. I have a stomach of iron. I have not thrown up since 1983. 
and I still have not thrown up since 1983. But that cherry tomato lands in my stomach, splash, and I am telling you, for the rest of the night, I am doubled over with an awful bellyache that I never have in my life. I don't ever have a bellyache. But that cherry tomato, for whatever reason, obviously I should not be eating cherry tomatoes, it causes me immense amounts of pain all night long. In an effort to get the little jerk to try a cherry tomato, I went through that suffering. Today, Charlie loves cherry tomatoes because eventually he caved, tried one, and said, hey, this is great. But I had to go through that suffering in order to get him there, which is what we do as parents. Sometimes we have to do the unthinkable in order to get our kids to do the thinkable. Thank you. All right, that's my story about a tomato. Went off the rails a little bit because I get a little crazy about taste. But let me um, quickly um, start with location in action. I actually don't remember how I started, but it's a habit. I can't help but doing it. But let me talk about, um, remember, we're not trying to match tomato to tomato when we're trying to think of a business purpose for this simple story, which is not much of a story. But I liked the end, the end of the story. Remember, we're trying to match um, theme, message, or meaning, theme, message, or meaning. And so the theme, message, or meaning, I sort of hit it on the end, which is as parents, we sometimes do the unthinkable so that our children will do the thinkable, right? And so in a business sense, can we think of moments where uh, someone needs to do something unthinkable to help other people do the thinkable, right? Or uh, role modeling is an example in this story. It's an example of um, role modeling in a positive way. It's an example of sacrifice, making a sacrifice in order to help other people sort of achieve a goal or to get somewhere that they want to go. So can you already start to see some of the business possibilities? Business possibilities related to making a sacrifice for others. I made a sacrifice for Charlie. Um, being a role model in that you're going to do things that you don't even like to do in order to sort of uh, get everyone on board and help them move forward. As a McDonald's manager uh, for almost 10 years of my life, off uh, about 10 years altogether while I was putting myself through high school and college, frankly, one of I was very good. I was a very good McDonald's manager. I was manager of the year for three years. But the reason I was really good was because I was so much like my employees. Uh, I was a kid who had no money and no hope and no future, which is what a lot of my employees were. They were people who were only working at McDonald's because they had no other choices. And I had the best attendance of any McDonald's manager in any restaurant I ever worked. Every place I went, people always came and worked for me. No one called out sick because I always was flipping burgers. And I was always unloading the truck and moving things into the freezer. And I was always working the registers. While many of the managers sort of didn't do any of the jobs that crew people did, but instead sort of like looked at their clipboard a lot <laughs> and uh, told people what to do, I would be telling people what to do and looking at the clipboard while I was flipping burgers. I was doing the job that they were doing so that they saw me as one of them and therefore, they came to work for me. I was also smart enough to pick them up all the, every morning when I went, it, went in at 4.30 in the morning. I'd drive around town and pick up all my employees because most of them don't have cars. They're all sort of struggling in a way that I was to a certain degree. Um, but that's an example of me as a boss role modeling what I wanted from my people and showing them that I was one of them. I did the same thing for Charlie. It didn't work that night. He didn't try a cherry tomato that night, but eventually he did. And sometimes it's no fun to role model. In my case, I was doubled over all night with a stomach ache, which I never have. But we have to do that. We have to, we have to do the job so that people believe that we can do the job, so that they can you know, do the job alongside us. I used to work with this manager named Lou. And Lou was a terrible McDonald's employee. He was a decent manager. But when it got busy and the managers had to take positions, Lou never had a position that he could be on because he could never keep up on anything. And the employees hated him for it. They would put him on chicken nuggets, which was the easiest job in the world, which is scoop out six nuggets, put them in a box, pass them forward. Scoop out nine nuggets, put them in a box, pass them forward. He couldn't keep up on chicken nuggets. So you can imagine how none of the employees wanted to work for Lou because they had no respect for him. If you can't do the job, then it's hard to have respect for you to tell someone to do the job. So that's a good story for that. I could tell the tomato story and I'd say, I could say, listen, you're in the role of a boss. You have to do the same thing. Sometimes you have to like do the job to show people you can do the job so that they believe in you and they believe that you understand what they're going through. You understand their sacrifice and their own pain and their own challenges so that you can help them through that process. That would be an easy business story. There's also probably examples of this like in sales. You know, one of the things that 
is so important in sales is the idea that um, you understand the product just as well as the person who's going to be buying the product. When I was actually, my favorite story is when I was buying replacement windows and I eventually bought my replacement windows from a person, not from a company, from a guy, Trevor Devine, who was a great storyteller who came into my house and made connections with me. And he's the one I bought windows from. One of the questions I asked all five of the companies that came in was, do you have these windows on your own home? Trevor does. Trevor has these windows, or at least he told me he did. He had his windows replaced by his company for half price. He admitted they charged him half price because he was a salesperson. And I thought that was great that he had actually had those windows put on his home. Some of the people said, well, I didn't need my windows replaced, so I didn't use this company. And, and that's fine. But boy, it's more impressive if you're like using the product, if you've made use of the product, if the product that you're selling is something that you are enjoying or have enjoyed. And so I would tell salespeople um, to learn from that lesson, like pay attention to that and and whenever possible, be engaging in the product that you are um, selling, if you can, in any way whatsoever. That's, that could be a helpful thing for sales. There's a million things we could do with the tomato story. But theme, message, and meaning is what you want to shoot for. You don't want to think about tomatoes. You don't want to think about kids. You don't want to think about food. You don't want to think about judgmental wives when it comes to food. You want to think about theme, message, and meaning. And that is a story about sacrifice. That is a story about role modeling. Uh, that is a story about uh, doing, doing the thing that you want other people to do. I guess that's role modeling. Those kinds of things. Be thinking about theme, message, and meaning with your stories. Then you can become a brick builder, which is you start with the story and then you find a purpose for it. And then, you know, I've given you an idea for tomatoes that took me, you know, five minutes to come up with. If, again, if you give me half an hour, I'll come up with some better ones. And you will too, once you start thinking about theme, message, and meaning. So those are our two, three, two, ones I did for this evening. Hopefully you found some new stories. I am going to go to my homework for life. And you don't, if you don't know what homework for life is, click on a new tab in your Chrome browser, or whatever browser you're using, type in the word homework for life and watch that video when we're done here. I am going to take the story ideas that I found tonight, the wall sconces with the candles, uh, the tomato, the tomato is probably in my homework for life because it happened a few years ago. I'm sure it's in my homework for life, but I'll go check to make sure it's there. But the wall sconces with the candles, that's a great one for me. I don't think the knitting sewing thing is in my homework for life between uh, how I couldn't figure out knitting from sewing for a long time. All of these things that I just found are going to end up in my homework for life and they're going to be coded as a memory, which is to say on this day, one of the most story worthy moments that happened to me was I remembered something from my past that meant something to me. And so I'm going to go record those as well. So we play three, two, one to find the stories, but for goodness sake, hold on to them. Don't just allow them to flitter through your mind and then disappear. That's a waste. We have to hold on to our content. We have to build our bricks. We're building our foundations with these bricks. And so I found some more foundational pieces tonight. And I hope you did too. All right. I'd be happy to take some questions. I have a couple pre-questions that we didn't answer last week. But before I look at any of those questions, I'd be happy to take any questions if you want to pop one in the chat. I'm looking at the chat now. I see some nice people saying some nice things to me. Thank you very much. I'm glad you liked the story. Uh, someone said I'm the most intelligent person they know. You don't really know me well enough, I'm afraid. Uh, if you knew me, you would know that is not the case. Uh, but I'm glad everything's looking good. I'm glad to hear you're enjoying the stories. I will go over to my questions that I have. I'm just giving the chat one second to drop a question in. But if you can't or don't, or don't have one, I have a couple questions from last week that I saved that I can go over to, which I'm going to now, to look over and see. <laughs> okay. And so now I'm going to come back over to the chat. I have a couple questions in my head. I have one. Let's see. Someone says, I read the book Storyworthy. I'm interested in the workshops. Can you talk about what's involved in them? Sure, I can do that first. So Matt, uh, nice to see you, Matt. I teach workshops. Uh, Often, uh, I just finished a parenting workshop a couple weeks ago. It was a workshop specifically designed for, uh, for parents to teach them how to tell stories and more importantly, to get their kids to tell stories. So, uh, so that was great. Um, so I teach them frequently. I do, the next one, we have, we have a couple webinars coming up where I'm going to talk about humor, uh, particularly humor in the professional setting. And I'm going to take Steve Jobs 
on 2007 iPhone launch, which is sort of an iconic keynote and break it down and show you exactly what he did. He's brilliant. So those are coming up, but those are webinars. Those are going to be passive sort of situations where you watch and don't interact very much with me. If you do attend a workshop where you're interacting with me, they tip, tend to be somewhere between two to six hours long. The six hour ones are crazy, but I like doing them. And two hours is probably a much more reasonable amount of time. But I teach. Uh, usually I tell a story and I'm teaching strategies from the story. I group you into small groups and you get to practice some of the skills that I'm teaching. Uh, it often comes with some kind of a workbook, not always, but um, lately, because my buddy Lionel likes a workbook and he helps me make them. So it comes with a workbook of some kind. Uh, it's a combination of instruction and participation. If you ever attend any of my live workshops, I still do live workshops uh, in coordination with a couple of venues that I've been working with for years. It's sort of outside story worthy to a certain degree because I've been doing it for a long time, but I have people come in and we do live workshops here in Connecticut, but you'd have to come to, to Connecticut to do that. Um, someone also said, um, do you do in-person workshops? Which is yes, what I do. Uh, I've been doing them for years. I do them in uh, conjunction with the Connecticut Historical Society. We have a partnership. So I teach live workshops here. I haven't done them Many of them, the, pan the pandemic sort of brought them to a halt and uh, the Historical Society actually has asked me to relaunch them and I'll consider doing that soon. And so, uh, yeah, those are day-long workshops where I teach and we practice and I, I do um, <laughs> I do uh, boot camps. I've done summer boot camps. The last summer boot camp I did, I had two people from China, a person from British Columbia, a person from San Diego and two people from Chicago all come to Connecticut. I don't like that level of prayer. That's a lot of stress. I like it when people live around the corner and they come to my workshop. But but yeah, I do live workshops like that. And um, I'm sure I'll be doing them again because the Historical Society is looking to get that going. They're the people who we partner with through Speak Up to tell uh, to produce shows. We do a lot of our shows at the Historical Society's Theater. And so I teach workshops in conjunction with that. So, so that'll be happening soon. And um, if you want to come to Connecticut, you can see that. Someone asked, what are the two types of things I was talking about? Um, there's bricks and there's band-aids. It's in my new book, actually. I talk a lot about it. There's two kinds of companies. There's the band-aid companies, which have me come in to fix problems. And then the brick companies, and those are people who understand that we start with story first and we use those stories to create the foundations for things we're going to use in our business and professional lives. So both are fine, but but the brick builders are tend to be the better storytellers. For someone who is interested, there's another question. For someone who's interested in storytelling on a stage, what are the, some of the ways you recommend getting a start open mic night at a comedy show telling stories in seniors homes any other ideas well if you live in a town where the moth is and there's lots of them i think there's more than 20 cities that's the best place to go it's a great community and people love it so look for storytelling in your community the moth or others in hartford connecticut which is not the center of the universe by any stretch of the imagination we have um my show speak up my wife and my show uh we have a show called uh, Tell Me Another, which is actually produced by one of my former storytelling students. She's created a show for, for it. We had a show called um, The Mouth, which sort of went into hiatus during the pandemic. And I'm not sure if it's back yet. I haven't heard about it yet, but we've had that. Uh, so those are three storytelling shows just in our area in Hartford. Uh, and then The Moth is in Boston and New York. So lots of opportunities. So you may have opportunities already in your city that you don't know about. You can also start your own storytelling show. We didn't have one in Hartford until we launched until Alicia and I launched one, we realized, hey, we should have storytelling here. doesn't take much. You find a venue. Our first venue was an art and theater space. And we said, hey, can we bring in people and you can sell them beer? And they said, that sounds great. And uh, we expected to get 40 people the first night. We ended up with 200. It was amazing. Uh, we started with just our friends who tell good stories, just gathered up people who we think tell good stories. And um it was great. That, that was in 2013, and we've been going strong ever since. We produced more than 100 shows at uh, more than two dozen venues throughout New England. It's been wonderful. So start your own. I have a friend in Seattle, or Tacoma, actually, just outside of Seattle. He has a storytelling Sunday morning buffet once a month. So he has his friends and neighbors and things come over for a Sunday buffet. Everyone brings a little bit of food, and they tell stories. When we were in Seattle I actually told a story at that Sunday morning event, which is in the living room to 30 people. And my daughter, Clara, actually told a story and didn't tell us she was going to tell one. She dropped her name in the hat, didn't tell us. I was putting cream cheese on a bagel when I heard John say, the next storyteller will be Clara. And I thought, that's funny. Someone else has the name Clara here. And suddenly my daughter was standing in front of the, in front of the crowd. 
Now she has me. I could have helped her like craft that story up a little bit. Like she didn't even ask me for assistance. She just got up and did it. It was amazing. It was a great story. She didn't need my help at all. Uh, but you could do that. Just have something in your house. Gather your friends. Uh, you know, uh, Joss Whedon is very famous for gathering his friends and doing live readings of Shakespearean plays in his home. And he actually produced one of these Shakespearean plays as a movie in his backyard with his friends. So like it doesn't take much. I would start with something like that. Also, obviously, you can go to some open mics. Those would be fine, too. Um, but if there's nothing, start something. Be one of those people. Someone asked if I'm coming to San Francisco. I actually am coming to San Francisco in August, but it's on vacation. I am not going to be um, teaching or performing when I'm in San Francisco. I'm going to be visiting Alcatraz and Lombard Street and Fisherman's Wharf and visiting one of my clients who is now one of my friends who lives there. How do we keep up with you when you have your webinars and workshops? If you are on our mailing list, uh, that is a great way to pay attention. If you are on the Facebook page, which is Storyworthy, um, storytelling for business and professionals. They will always be posted there as well. So get on the mailing list. Uh, if you go to storyworthymd.com, you can get on the mailing list and uh, get on our Facebook page. I announce things there as well. That's where you'll find out when those are happening. Uh, someone asks, I'm creating several stories about finding my birth parents and other relatives. Um, YouTube, I'm thinking, 10 minutes. What do you recommend? Interesting. Well, I would say I like the fact that you've called it stories and not a story. I think the shorter version of stories, the best versions of stories. I think um, when you say finding my birth parents, my instant instinct is there's probably three stories in there. And if you think it's one, it's probably three. You're looking for moments of meaning within that context of that story. And it's better to have three stories than one. So many people want to tell the story. Don't ever want to tell the story. You want to segment that story and have a multitude of stories. I was arrested and tried for a crime I did not commit. So far, over the course of my storytelling journey, I've told the story of my arrest, the actual questioning and arrest. I've also told the story just about the booking process, the fingerprinting and all of that. That's actually a story. I had a meaningful moment in that particular event. And that's all I've told so far, the interrogation and arrest and the booking. I have not told the trial yet, which is crazy. But the trial's huge. So I'm either going to have to like tell it as a solo show or I'm going to have to break it into pieces, which I've been trying to do. Um, don't try to tell the story. Try to tell many stories about a big moment in your life, like finding your birth parents. That is my advice. Uh, I think that we often try to say too much. A story can be about one thing and only one thing. So pick the one thing. You know, I don't know what your experience is like, but your first story might just be finding the identity of your birth parents. End of story. The next one might be the journey to find your birth parents. End of story. The third one might be the knocking on the door of your birth parents. End of story. The fourth one might be sitting in a living room with the birth parents and discovering things about your childhood or about your birth that you never knew. End of story. So you've got probably many stories there. Break them up into um, a multitude of stories. People want that anyway. They don't want a 22 minute story about you finding your parents. They want a six minute story about a part of it and then a seven minute story and then a five minute story. That's all better. And, and on YouTube, you just create, um, create a playlist. I think that's what Joey and Lionel call it a playlist so that they just play one after another and you can link them all together. So it can kind of be a story, but then you can push them out one a little bit at a time. So that is how I would do that. Um, I would definitely break it up in that way. Uh, other than that, yeah, YouTube works well. I would be definitely looking to have some B-roll in there. If you're just going to stare at the camera for seven minutes and tell a story, that's a little rough. You know, the best version of these stories is often be on a stage and have people record you telling it and have the audience respond to it. That's a great way to record it too. I know that's, that's a little harder. The moth will actually, if you get to a moth and you want to tell any one of these stories, the moth records every show or every story that's told and you can purchase the story. You can purchase the video or the audio. And so they, you can actually end up with these, um, these stories, these recordings. That's a lot of the, a lot of the stories you see from me on YouTube are recordings of me at the moth performing. Uh, some of them are speak up and some of them other things, but yeah, that's a good way to do it too. All right. Uh, hopefully that helps. Good luck with that. And um, congratulations on finding your birth parents. That sounds interesting. Uh, thank you for all the kind comments and the kind thoughts. I um, thank you very much for um, those of you who have 
said things that are too kind. I appreciate your exceeding kindness. Um, it's a it's a wonderful and joyous thing. Oh, good. You have photos and music for your stories. Perfect. Good B-roll. Maybe get a good editor if you can find someone who will do it for you. Or like if you don't want to pay for it, there's lots of college people who want to do things and um, are willing to do it for free in order to find content and a platform. It's a lot of weird people in the world. I know this is going to sound crazy. There's a lot of people who don't want to tell their own stories, but want to help people tell their stories. I think it's crazy. Why would you not want to tell your own story? But there are people out there. They're called editors. They're called directors. They, they're like not interested in sharing their own life, but they're interested in helping other people share their own life. And there's lots of students, uh, high school and college, frankly, high school too, who uh, can do this work and uh, are just looking for content to work with. So you might be able to find people to help you do that too. But best of luck with all of it. Thank you all for joining me. Um, it's been wonderful. If you would like to learn more about the work I'm doing, you can go to storyworthymd.com where you can find lots of free resources, um, lots of videos, uh, lots of things that will help you become a better storyteller. I've got courses that you can take a look at, uh, courses that will take you to finding stories and telling stories, lots of things that will help you along your journey. If you have not yet, you should subscribe to my YouTube channel. It is uh, youtube.com slash at storyworthymd. And uh, there we are constantly putting up new content. And uh, th that includes stories and ideas and strategies and uh, YouTube content like this. This will appear there in bits and pieces or maybe um, as a whole piece, whatever my people decide to do with it. They're all smarter than me in this regard. So. So I hope this was really helpful. I really thank you for being here. And I am going to see you at the same time and the same day next week. Go find some stories, tell some stories, and um, have a great week, everybody.